Another day, another recap. Today we'll be diving into another movie franchise recap that will contain the movies Jumanji, Jumanji Welcome to the Jungle and Jumanji The Next Level. So without further ado, sit back, relax and enjoy the recap. The first movie opens up on a dark and scary night in 1869 where two brothers go to the woods to bury a trunk. Despite the ominous tribal drumbeats being heard from it, they focus on finishing their task to save people from whatever lies within. Once the trunk is safely buried, they hurry back to their town of Brantford. A century later in 1969, Brantford is a peaceful small town where Alan Parrish lives with his parents. As he goes around town one day on his bicycle, he is followed by his bullies. Increasing his speed to avoid them, Alan rushes to his father's shoe factory. Inside he meets Carl who excitedly shows him a new sample that he worked on. Spotting his father, Alan then requests him for a ride home. Correctly guessing that his son is trying to avoid facing his bullies, he asks him to be brave instead. While the kids destroy Alan's bicycle outside, nobody realizes that the new sample is on the factory's conveyor belt. Alan is reluctantly leaving the factory when the conveyor belt malfunctions and shreds Carl's sample leading to him taking all the responsibility. Outside, Alan has his bike stolen after being beaten up just as he hears the sound of tribal drumbeats. Following the sound to a construction site he pulls out a trunk. Breaking the lock open he discovers a board game named Jumanji and runs home with it. At home, thoroughly impressed with the mysterious find, he picks up a couple of game pieces. Upon suddenly hearing his mother, he drops them and they strangely take their places at the start of the game. Quickly hiding Jumanji, Alan goes over to his mother. Later that evening he argues with his parents about not wanting to attend a boarding school as they prepare to leave for an event. Alone at home later, he plans to run away and gathers his belongings along with some money and food. Grabbing Jumanji he is about to head out the door when his friend Sarah arrives and says that she brought his bicycle back. When she hears the sound of the drumbeats, Alan shares the game with her. Unimpressed by the idea of a board game, she drops the dice and gets up to leave. However, the game pieces moving on their own compels her to stay. With the game officially started, a cryptic message appears in the center of the game which scares both the kids. However, when Alan inadvertently drops the dice, another message appears which states that he will have to be in a jungle till someone rolls a 5 or an 8 on the dice. To Sarah's shock, Alan is then sucked into the game even as he keeps yelling for her to continue playing. However, the appearance of a swarm of bats scares her and she runs out. The game remains incomplete for another 26 years till the time Nora acquires the parish mansion intending to turn it into a bed and breakfast. She moves in with her brother's children, Judy and Peter as they lost their parents in a car accident in Canada the earlier year. A few days later, Peter sees a bat in the attic and runs out scared, forcing Nora to get it checked the next morning. The exterminator tells the kids that they should be worried about a little boy named Alan Parrish instead. Based on the rumors around town, he says that the kid lost his life in that house and that his father must have been responsible. That night, Judy wakes up to the sound of drumbeats and goes over to Peter's room. They both hear it a while later and again the next morning. After Nora leaves for the day, the children are unable to ignore the drumbeats and finally follow the sound to the attic. Amidst the intensified drumbeats, they find Jumanji and quickly set it up. Noticing that he cannot move the game pieces already on the board, Peter gets out the remaining two game pieces which automatically take their places. With Judy's first roll, the game summons massive mosquitoes. She swats at them with a racket sending them straight out the window. On Peter's double roll, they hear a commotion in the kitchen. Rushing over, they find it taken over by a bunch of monkeys spilling food and causing all kinds of chaos. Realizing that the monkeys are part of the game, they hurry back to the attic. There, Judy reads the warning on the game that advises players to begin only if they intend to finish. Further reading that everything will be back to normal when a player finishes the game, getting another turn because of his earlier double, Peter now rolls F5. This summons a lion who chases them out of the attic. Running away, they still find themselves cornered till a man appears. Once the kids run and hide, the man tries to keep the lion at bay. He eventually tricks it and the lion ends up locked in a room. The man then looks around the place and senses Judy and Peter hiding in the closet. Seemingly recognizing the house, he then kicks down one of the locked doors and is relieved about returning. Indeed this man is Alan who has spent all this time trapped in the game, and has finally been released since Peter rolled a 5. Alan thanks Peter for his freedom but his relief soon turns to grief as he realizes that his parents are not around. Correctly guessing his identity, Judy tells him that the house had been abandoned for many years, and that everyone believed him to have passed a long time ago. Alan rushes out of the house in shock and encounters a police officer on the lookout for monkeys. Judy tries to get him out of trouble by making all kinds of excuses when he realizes that the police officer is Carl from his father's shoe factory. Just then, he spots a couple of monkeys getting in the police car and makes some sounds and actions to get them out. While this makes Carl think he is unwell, he is surprised when the monkeys not only fire his weapon but even drive away the car making him chase them. 
Helen then decides to look for his parents and Peter and Judy follow him to his father's shoe factory. Spotting movement on the floor above, he rushes over and finds a man he doesn't recognize. He is then told that his father ignored the business to focus on finding Alan after his disappearance. Eventually, the factory had to be shut down for good when the parishes met their ends in 1991. After visiting the cemetery, Judy tries to convince Alan to join the game with them when an accident occurs. Overhearing the paramedics say that the driver was among 50 others who suffered a bug bite of sorts, Alan quickly gets the kids in the car and asks what came out of the game before him. In reply, Peter points out the giant mosquito outside the car. To escape its attack, Alan somehow manages to drive the car back home. Picking out clothes from the attic he then heads to the bathroom to clean up. Heavily relieved about finally being out of the jungle, he remains adamant about not playing the game with them, but Judy and Peter decide to continue on their own. In an attempt to prove that he isn't afraid of the game, Alan insists that they will not be able to go much further without him, and agrees to watch them play instead. Setting the game up in the living room, Judy rolls the dice, however her game piece remains stationary. When she asks Alan for help, he notices the four game pieces on the board and realizes that they are continuing the game he started with Sarah back in 1969. Finally understanding that he will have to participate for the game to end, he also realizes that it is now Sarah's turn. The children then accompany him to Sarah's old house. Alan recognizes the woman who opens the door as Sarah and introduces himself which causes her to faint in shock. After carrying her back home, Alan and the kids listen as she leaves a message for her doctor on the phone later. It seems that she has been in therapy all these years because of the game and Alan's disappearance. Her shock at seeing Jumanji and her reluctance to play makes it clear that the past left a deep impact on her. When she continues to be doubtful about participating, Alan tricks her into rolling the dice and the appearance of gigantic carnivorous vines gets everyone to their feet. Having experienced the vines before in the jungle, Alan advises them not to touch any just as Peter gets pulled by one. Grabbing him, they realize that the scariest and largest vine has caught Peter. Borrowing the sword of his ancestor, Alan chops off the vine to free him. Meanwhile Carl locates his abandoned car and heads back to Alan's place where the game continues in the library this time. When Sarah tries to escape, Alan acknowledges the pain and loneliness caused by the game, reminding them that everything will be fine after the game is over. Judy asks them to focus. To further comfort Sarah, everyone promises to continue playing even if she gets stuck in the game. She then agrees to participate and Alan rolls the dice. The game then releases Van Pelt, a hunter that Alan had the misfortune of meeting earlier in the game. He chases Alan through the house and out the door where Carl spots him. Not bothered by authority, Van Pelt continues to take his shots till he runs out of bullets. Having the craziest of days, Carl then goes looking for the hunter. After successfully avoiding Van Pelt, Alan returns home. But while Alan and Sarah incessantly bicker about the game and their past, Judy rolls the dice to continue the game. They stop arguing immediately when Alan picks up on the sounds of a rapidly approaching stampede. Grabbing the game, he follows the others out of the library, even as a variety of animals are released from the game in a wild stampede. Following the animals, a pelican steals Jumanji and flies away. Alan follows it out, and the others rush to join him. Meanwhile Van Pelt walks into a store and gets himself an updated weapon. To strike a deal with the pelican, Alan offers it a fish but Jumanji slips and falls into the stream below. Following its movement, Peter quickly gets in position over the branches of a tree and grabs it just in time. On the other hand, Van Pelt returns to the house only to see the destruction left behind by the stampede and follows the trail. On their way back home, Alan and the others run into Carl. When Alan is arrested, he senses Van Pelt around and hence chooses to go with Carl promising the others to continue the game later. Intending to finish the game himself, Peter attempts to cheat on his turn which results in him gaining hairy arms as punishment. Meanwhile, the situation in town worsens when the monkeys wreak havoc. On their way into town, Alan learns that his father fired Carl for his mistake all those years ago. He then introduces himself and apologizes for what he'd done. Sarah, Judy, and Harry Peter hitch a ride into town where Van Pelt steals Jumanji from them. However, Peter manages to grab it back and quickly disappears into the crowd escaping from the stampede. He hides in a car and miraculously survives the oncoming animals. Van Pelt spots him though, and he steals the game again. Judy and Sarah help Peter out of the car and follow Van into a discount store. They spot Jumanji on a counter and Sarah steps forward to grab it only to be caught by the hunter. With the help of the others she manages to escape and Alan meanwhile assures Carl that he can put an end to all the chaos the town is facing, he is set free. However, after he cuffs Carl for his safety, they hear about a hostage situation at the discount store. With Carl's hand still cuffed to the door of his car, Alan drives towards the shop where the trio are preparing all kinds of traps to capture Van Pelt. He narrowly escapes slipping on a bunch of liquid detergent but he isn't able to avoid Peter's makeshift attack boat. 
When the hunter crashes through the store in the boat, the trio make their way out with the game. However, the hunter lets loose a rack of tires to trap them all. Alan in the meantime drives right into the store and crashes through various aisles before toppling a rack of paint cans directly onto Van Pelt. Sarah then quickly retrieves Jumanji from the mess and the players are back together. Nora in the meantime is on her way back home when she witnesses the passing stampede. Unknown to her, a monkey gets in her car and causes her to drive off the road when she realizes its presence. Sarah and Alan get back to the mansion with Judy and Peter who now has a long tail. They find the place completely taken over by the vines. After getting rid of his cuffs, Carl gets in his car to go over to Alan's place. Coming across Nora walking along the road he stops when she asks for help getting home. However, much to their shock his car is taken over by strong vines and is completely destroyed as it gets pulled into the trees. Sarah meanwhile rolls the dice which brings a storm indoors, and the group struggles to find shelter while the appearance of a crocodile only adds to their problems. While Alan pulls Peter up by his tail to get him to safety on the chandelier, Sarah narrowly avoids sliding straight into the crocodile. Alan then bravely grabs the creature while Sarah gets to safety. Just then, Carl and Nora arrive at the door outside just as it blows open and lets all the chaos out. The crocodile ends up outdoors with the flow of the water, and Alan gets everyone safely down from the chandelier even as Noah and Carl float outside. Back in the attic, Alan rolls the dice and the floor turns into quicksand for him. As Sarah tries her best to get him out, Judy just takes her turn and the quicksand turns back to the floor holding Alan in place with Sarah. Asking Peter to continue the game, Alan thanks Sarah for staying back and not running away this time. With Peter's turn summoning giant spiders he heads over to the woodshed downstairs to look for an axe even as Judy attempts to swat them off. Nora gets home just then and is shocked to see the condition of the place. When Peter spots her on his way back to the attic with an axe, he locks her in the closet promising to explain later. He then hurries to the attic just in time to hack at a vine that attacked Judy. As Sarah takes her turn, Judy collapses due to the poisonous vine. The spiders scatter with an earthquake being summoned, and Alan realizes that Judy can only be saved if the game is finished. As the house splits in two, Jumanji falls, and Alan also decides to fall towards it using a vine. After swinging back and forth he grabs the game and as he opens it up for his turn, Van Pelt returns. He tells him to drop whatever he's holding in his hand, and Alan drops the dice with one landing on the board and the other just rolling away. Once it finally stops rolling, Alan completes the game and says the word Jumanji as Sarah runs in the way of an oncoming bullet which stops midair and begins to disappear. The bullet as well as all the animals and the hunter start getting sucked back into the game until all is finally over. With everything safely back in the game, Sarah and Alan go back to the year 1969. Relieved to see his father, Alan runs over to hug him and the two bury their differences. Relieved to be told that he didn't have to go to boarding school against his wishes, Alan comes clean about the factory's conveyor belt to save Carl's job. Later, Alan and Sarah with the memory and knowledge of their future selves chuck Jumanji into a river. In 1994, Sarah and Alan are now together with a child on the way. They welcome a couple to their place for a party who turns out to be Judy and Peter's parents. After giving the kids their gifts, Alan offers a marketing job for his shoe factory to Judy's father ensuring that they cancel their trip to Canada, thereby averting their accident altogether. Elsewhere, two young girls hear the sound of drumbeats on a beach, and Jumanji is seen halfway buried in the sand looking for its next players. In the year 1996, a man comes across Jumanji on the beach one morning and offers it to his son Alex thinking that he might find it cool. However, since it is a mere board game, Alex dismisses it in favor of his video games. That night though, a bright light causes him to wake up and he notices that Jumanji has transformed into a video game cartridge. Curious about it now, he plugs it in and gets sucked into the game. 21 years later, Spencer is deeply engrossed in video games in the solitude of his room. Meanwhile on the other side of town the celebrated sportsman, Fridge, is preparing for school when he informs his mother of his plans to meet Spencer beforehand for tutoring sessions, as he is about to be booted from the football team. And lastly we are introduced to Bethany, but it seems Alex's gorgeous home has now turned into what is known as the Freak House. Spencer meets Fridge outside it and hands him the essay he wrote for him. Fridge who used to be friends with Spencer as children, now only gets his help with homework to keep his grades up and maintain his place on the team. After Fridge leaves Mr. Vreek's sudden appearance startles Spencer. After hearing his ominous warning of hanging around dangerous places, Spencer makes a run for it. At school later, Bethany gets awarded a detention for using her phone during class, and Martha gets detention for refusing to participate in her gym activities. After getting called to the principal's office that day, Spencer finds Fridge already waiting. Their cheating having caught the attention of their teacher, they not only get detention, but Fridge gets kicked off his team as well. For detention, Principal Bentley leads the four of them to the school's abandoned storage space which is soon to be converted to a computer center. 
recruiting their help to clean the space out, he sets them the extremely boring task of removing the staples from the heap of magazines that are to be discarded. While Spencer and Martha get to work, Fridge roams around and Bethany looks for her phone's reception. When Fridge finds an old game console and intrigued Spencer plugs it into the television, allowing them to leave the world behind Jumanji welcomes them to play. In its modern form the game asks them to select a character from a few options. Fridge chooses to be a zoologist named Finbar. Spencer chooses Dr. Bravestone and Bethany is Shelley Oberon. Martha reluctantly picks up the remaining character, Ruby Roundhouse. The sound of tribal drumbeats indicates the start of the game which freaks the group out enough for Spencer to unplug it. However, the situation gains more strangeness when they get sucked into the game itself. A while later, the group crashes into a jungle as the characters of their choice. Initially, they don't recognize themselves nor each other but Spencer finally puts it all together and realizes that they are in the game. As the imposing Dr. Bravestone himself, he points to Fridge's vest with the name of the zoologist Finbar which leads to confirming that Martha is Ruby. The shock here is that Bethany's character, Professor Oberon is not a woman as she thought. While she comes to terms with being a man, Ruby spots a three-mark tattoo, and the others see that they possess the same, when the group continues to bicker about who is at the most disadvantaged among them. A hippopotamus devours Professor Oberon, still recovering from the shock the rest of them are taken aback when Professor Oberon comes crashing down from the sky. Before they can get over the fact that Finbar can now recite animal facts on demand, Ruby spots danger in the form of another hippopotamus causing them to run to safety. Quite conveniently, they come across a man in a jeep who not only welcomes them to Jumanji but also offers them a ride. Introducing himself as Nigel Billingsley, the man then tells the group that Jumanji is depending on the four of them to lift the curse which he wrote in his letter to Dr. Bravestone. When said letter magically appears, Dr. Bravestone reads from it to know that his former partner Professor Van Pelt had been to the jungle on an expedition, guiding him to a jaguar shrine. Nigel had accompanied Van Pelt to find the sacred jewel of Jumanji so he could document its information. However, he didn't know about Van Pelt's objective of wanting to acquire the jewel for himself. With the jewel stolen, Van Pelt was taken over by a dark power allowing him to control all the animals of the jungle. Determined to save the jungle, Nigel had stolen the jewel back that night. This led to Van Pelt unleashing his men in the jungle with orders to retrieve the stone and to slaughter anyone who got in their way. Handing over the jewel to Dr. Bravestone now, Nigel wishes them good luck for their mission of returning it to the Jaguar Shrine. As it turns out the only way out of the game is to save Jumanji after lifting its curse. Asking Finbar to place the jewel safely in his bag, Dr. Bravestone then consults the incomplete map of Jumanji that Nigel handed out. Seeing just a blank page, the group realizes that only Professor Oberon could read the map with cartography being the character's skill. Dr. Bravestone then accidentally figures out how to pull up the strengths and weaknesses of their characters. With no weaknesses he seems quite satisfied but the same cannot be said for the rest. While Ruby's weakness of Venom is still acceptable, Professor Oberon is not as lucky with Endurance listed as his weakness. However, with Cake, Speed and Strength listed as his weaknesses, there is possibly nothing worse for Finbar. But problematically, as Professor Oberon studies the map to evaluate their next steps, they are attacked by Van Pelt's men. Despite Dr. Bravestone being the last to begin running away he easily takes over the group while Finbar ends up last. After splitting up to avoid getting caught, Ruby is surprised at the use of her acrobatic skills. Professor Oberon on the other hand slips and falls right in the path of attack. Ruby ends up saving him while Bravestone gets Finbar to check his bag for weapons. Seeing a boomerang Dr. Bravestone recognizes his skill and confidently launches it at their attackers and on its way back it successfully takes down the attackers chasing them. Dr. Bravestone then offers to carry Finbar so they can escape the rest on foot. The jungle suddenly gives way to a cliff as the group gets together again. Suggesting jumping into the water below, Ruby takes the lead with the others following soon after. Once they are safe and back on land, Ruby informs the group that she got hit and disappears. Even as Finbar tries to understand whether she was done for good, she crashes on him. Checking that her tattoo only had two marks now, Dr. Bravestone concludes that they had three lives to fulfill their mission, and that Professor Oberon and Ruby had already lost a life each. This also leads to another more startling realization that they could actually lose their life in the game if they run through all their chances, much like a game over scenario in a video game. Intending to find the missing piece of the map, the group heads on to the village in the hopes of finding the bazaar. Meanwhile at Van Pelt's camp, he receives news from his men that they lost Dr. Bravestone and the group in the jungle. Disappointed in his men's efforts he employs the help of the jungle's animals to catch them. On their way to the village on the map, Professor Oberon and Ruby have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation which makes them realize that Bethany and Martha may have opposing views about each other but they are actually very similar and could even support each other as friends. Finbar and Dr. Bravestone also bicker about not being friends anymore and being stuck in a video game. 
Dr. Bravestone points out that Fridge just got so popular that he behaved as if Spencer didn't even exist anymore, till the time he needed his help for homework, telling him to not be so proud of his physical appearance in the game, Finbar shoves Dr. Bravestone off the cliff, when Dr. Bravestone comes back with one less life and some anger, he smacks Finbar and then saves him from falling off the cliff so as not to waste lives anymore. Finally reaching the bazaar, Professor Oberon and Ruby get some bread to eat. Joining them, Finbar has a bite as well but soon realizes that it isn't bread but actually cake. Since it is one of his weaknesses, Finbar expects something to go wrong but nothing happens. Just when he thinks that he is safe, he explodes. Everyone in the group now has one less life once Finbar crashes back into the game. Soon after, they follow a young boy who recognizes Dr. Bravestone. While the exchange is witnessed by Van Pelt's bird, the boy leads the group to a basket, advising everyone to trust each other and not blink he then runs off. The timid Spencer and the mighty Dr. Bravestone battle it out as he opens the basket's cover to reveal a snake within, while everyone thinks they had to have a staring contest with the snake. Finbar eventually realizes that they had to defang the snake and goes on to skillfully get it done. Professor Oberon then finds a package in the now empty basket inside which he finds a small elephant statue with a note that says to begin climbing when seen. Deciding to keep an eye out for an elephant the group makes its way through the bazaar again, only to find Van Pelt and his men. Using Spencer's video game expertise Dr. Bravestone strongly tackles this obstacle and meets the next one to continue displaying his combat skills. He does this for several more men as the others watch and are thoroughly impressed. Eventually, Van Pelt himself faces Dr. Bravestone and demands the jewel back. Just then, a masked stranger asks the group to join him. Leading everyone down a secret passage he tells them how happy he is to see them all there. Dr. Bravestone and Finbar correctly guess that he must be the fifth character in the game. Jefferson McDonough, the aircraft pilot that they weren't able to choose, skillfully guiding them through the traps on the way, he then gets everyone back in the jungle and introduces himself as Alex. Back in the bazaar, Van Pelt guesses that Jefferson helped Dr. Bravestone's group and unleashes a scorpion on one of his men to end his life. Meanwhile everyone settles down with Alex's character Jefferson at a treehouse that was built by Alan Parrish during his time in the jungle. The conversation then steers to how long Jefferson was stuck in the game, because of time behaving differently in Jumanji, Jefferson believes that he has been there for a few months. He says that he has lost two lives already trying to get past the next level. The group then realizes that Jefferson is the missing piece they were supposed to find and that together, they can help each other out of the game. Despite his initial fear of being down to his last life, he agrees to join forces with Dr. Bravestone and the rest of his crew. For the first time as a team of five he then leads them to the location of the next level. Their aim is to grab a vehicle from the guarded transportation shed to get across the canyon and reach the Jaguar Shrine. The team's plan is for Ruby to distract the soldiers guarding the shed enough for the others to sneak in. As the guys wait for Ruby, Jefferson's dated vocabulary makes them ask him which year it was when he played the game. Learning that he played Jumanji in 1996 leads the group to the realization that he was the same Alex that their town knows as the boy who disappeared two decades ago. Even as Jefferson deals with the shock of having been stuck in the game for that long, Ruby arrives at the transportation shed. The guys successfully manage to break into the shed. However, still reeling with the shock of having spent 20 years in the game, Jefferson is overwhelmed when asked which vehicle to choose. Hearing a crash from within the shed, Ruby engages her combat skills to take the men out. As she triumphantly enters the shed later, Finbar sees Van Pelt's men making their way to them and quickly urges everyone to take the helicopter and leave. Down on his last life Jefferson is scared but decides to take the responsibility of flying. Upon takeoff Van Pelt's men open fire and manage to hit the rotor leading to a drastic drop in height which makes them sink to the bottom of the canyon. Jefferson informs everyone that since the collective was damaged he could not get them in the air anymore and continues to fly at a low height. Just then, they see a herd of albino rhinos chasing them. Making a drastic decision, Bravestone volunteers to fix the damage on the rotor, and after Jefferson tells him that he needs to connect the control rod to the mesh plate, he makes his way to the exterior of the helicopter. With the rhinos behind them and the fast approaching end of the canyon ahead of them, Dr. Bravestone fixes the rotor just in time for Jefferson to wildly pull them up. However, the jewel drops out of Finbar's bag and into the canyon. With the mission in major jeopardy without the jewel, the helicopter is looped back to the canyon to retrieve it. Spotting the jewel at the center of the circle the rhinos had formed, Dr. Bravestone thinks of a way to distract them. He then pushes Finbar into the canyon and while the rhinos chase him he jumps off the helicopter and grabs the jewel. He then guides Jefferson to roll the helicopter in time to catch Finbar as he drops from the sky after losing one life. Safely landing across the canyon later, Jefferson is pleased to have finally made it through the level he has been stuck at only for him to succumb to a mosquito bite. As his last life flickers, Oberon performs CPR to get him back. Strangely for Jefferson to be saved, Oberon needs to give up a life. With both of them on their last life now along with Finbar, the mission is back on track and they head out to find the Jaguar Shrine. By nightfall the group reaches the shrine and a path magically lights up all the way to the statue. 
However, sensing that it must be a trap since this is the final level of the game, they do not start the path immediately. Instead, spotting an elephant statue by the side, they are reminded of the message that advised them to begin climbing. Opting to take the root of the trees to the statue, Dr. Bravestone gets going. He isn't able to go too far though, as he startles upon seeing a squirrel and crashes down the trees only to be ambushed by jaguars. They disappear only after he loses a life and re-enters the game down to his last life. Scared about having no more lives to spare, Dr. Bravestone speaks privately with Finbar and tells him that he isn't confident about his abilities anymore. Finbar brings to his attention that we always have just one life in reality and assures him that if they were all together, they could surely accomplish their mission. Finbar then splits everyone up around the path to work as a unit to ensure a clear way for Dr. Bravestone while Ruby tackles Van Pelt's men at the entrance. When she gets dragged by one of them Bravestone gets rid of him and borrows the motorcycle. Finally reaching the foot of the shrine he comes across Van Pelt having captured Professor Oberon. When Dr. Bravestone confesses to not having the jewel, Finbar arrives atop an elephant. Seeing that Finbar had the jewel, Van Pelt directs the jaguars at the elephant who easily swats at them. However, the jewel gets flung some distance away. Asking Dr. Bravestone to continue on his way to the top, Ruby volunteers to find the jewel. While the others tackle Van Pelt, she locates the jewel amidst a bunch of snakes and makes her way carefully through them. Grabbing the jewel, she then notices the arrival of Van Pelt. She confidently lets herself get bitten by a snake and loses a life. Seeing her on the way down from the sky, Dr. Bravestone speeds up enough to reach her in time and get the jewel while she lands safely. Immediately placing it on the statue, Dr. Bravestone and the group call out Jumanji's name to end the game. With the jungle restored to its former glory, Nigel meets the group and shakes each of their hands to expel them from the game. Each and every one of them shake their hands and finally return back to the world. Still in the storage space of the school, Spencer, Fridge, Bethany and Martha wonder why Alex did not join them. On their way back from school they head over to the freak house only to find it restored and lovingly decorated. The visitor of the house seemingly recognizes them and walks over. Correctly guessing that he was Alex, everyone is pleased to see him. Glad about meeting them again he tells them that the game dropped him back in 1996. Introducing his infant son, he also mentions that he named his elder daughter Bethany to honor the girl that saved his life. Back in school the next week, Spencer and Fridge pick up their friendship again, and Bethany is a part of the group as well. But out of nowhere, the group hears the sound of the tribal drumbeats. They immediately decide to destroy it so it never finds more players to trap. After being apart from each other during their college year, Bethany, Martha, Fridge and Spencer make plans to meet over the break. Spencer travels home to Brantford and meets his mother and grandfather, Eddie, who is recovering from a hip surgery. Attending NYU now, Spencer tells his grandfather that night that senior year of high school felt like the most enjoyable time since he had his friends with him. Disappointed about the way his life has turned out now compared to his friends, Spencer is unable to sleep and hence heads to the basement and finds the destroyed pieces of Jumanji. The next morning, Fridge meets Bethany and Martha for brunch at a local diner as planned. After catching up with their lives, they wonder why Spencer hadn't joined them yet. On the other hand, Eddie finds his friend Milo on the doorstep inviting himself in for a cup of coffee. Since Eddie had refused to call Milo back he had taken it upon himself to check up on him. As it turns out the two friends had owned the best restaurant in town back in the day, which has now turned into the diner where Fridge, Bethany and Martha discuss Spencer's absence. When they make their way over to Spencer's home to check on him, Martha sneaks upstairs to his room while Fridge joins Milo in the kitchen. The sudden sound of tribal drumbeats alerts the three friends to the return of Jumanji in their life and they find the game somehow put back together in the basement. Correctly assuming that Spencer must have returned to the game, they realize that he wouldn't be able to get back out of there on his own. Convincing the others to enter the game to help Spencer, Martha picks up the controller. Letting out a spark, it immediately begins to suck everyone in without any of them getting to select their characters. Unfortunately, Bethany gets left behind on her own. Landing in the jungle of Jumanji, Martha realizes that she is back to being Ruby Roundhouse. However, Dr. Bravestone is Spencer's grandfather Eddie, and Finbar is his friend Milo. Surprisingly, Fridge ends up being Bethany's previous character Professor Oberon. To uncomplicate Eddie and Milo's understanding of the entire scenario, Ruby and Professor Oberon tell them that they are all characters of a video game now, and that they had to find Spencer. Coming to terms with the fact that Spencer was there too, and that these kids have all done this once before, the new Dr. Bravestone and Finbar appreciate being young again with bones and muscles that work perfectly. Anticipating an attack from the hippopotamus, Ruby pushes Finbar out of harm's way just in time, even as Professor Oberon urges everyone to stay alert at all times, he himself gets eaten by a gigantic snake and comes crashing down a while later, having lost one life already. Jumanji continues to be similar but different when Nigel arrives on a plane this time and offers the group a ride. However exactly like the last time, he informs them that Jumanji is in danger, and that he had written to Dr. Bravestone about it all. 
The letter again magically appears in Eddie's hand and Dr. Bravestone reads it to know about the return of Jurgen the Brutal. He and his men attacked the avian province a while back and stole the fertility jewel of Jumanji called the Falcon Jewel from the village elder. Locking up the jewel and hiding it away from the sun has caused Jumanji to suffer a terrible drought following which Nigel was forced to ask Dr. Bravestone for help. Therefore, the only way to get out of Jumanji this time is to retrieve the Falcon Jewel and expose it to the sun, handing over a map with instructions to find an oasis and to follow the flame to the desert fruit. Nigel evicts everyone from the plane and in the middle of a desert. Meanwhile, a frustrated Bethany pokes around Jumanji and eventually leaves Spencer's basement. When Professor Oberon finds a bunch of abandoned buggies in the desert, Ruby tells him that they need to find Spencer and begin playing the game if they hope to leave. Eddie's Dr. Bravestone then spots an animal in the distance and Milo's zoologist Finbar informs the group that it is an ostrich. As he goes on to list out ostrich facts at an exceedingly slow pace, the animal makes its way to them. Dr. Bravestone tries to shoo the bird away and is then attacked by it, thereby losing a life. When he gets back into the game, Ruby instructs both Eddie and Milo about having just three lives and that losing all their lives will result in them being stuck in the game. The sound of drum beats then alerts the group to an oncoming danger when Finbar narrates the fact of ostriches always traveling in herds. Spotting the herd, the group hurriedly gets into two buggies in an attempt to outrun the ostriches, while Professor Oberon and Ruby's buggy gets continuously pecked on. Finbar is grabbed by one of the ostriches and Dr. Bravestone holds onto him. He is eventually able to pull him safely back into the buggy and then punch the bird out of their way. He continues to outrun the herd and even picks up Professor Oberon and Ruby on the way after they crash. With the herd still chasing them, he spots a ramp and speeds up to get them across the canyon. While the buggy brutally crashes into the canyon, everyone is able to get to the other side safely. Later bringing up Dr. Bravestone's strengths and weaknesses, Ruby and Professor Oberon are surprised to see that Switchblade has been added as the only weakness now. Interestingly, Nunchucks are Ruby's new strength and Linguistics has been added to Finbar's strengths while his weaknesses sadly remain the same. Meanwhile Oberon seems to be at the most disadvantage this time with Geometry as an added strength while ironically Heat, Sun and Sand are his weaknesses now. A while later, the group makes their way north through the desert when Milo attempts to bury the hatchet by telling his friend that the decision to sell their restaurant and retire was correct. But Eddie wants to hear none of it. By evening they finally arrive at the next level of the game when they locate the oasis. Meanwhile Bethany rushes to Alex and asks for help in fixing the game so she can enter Jumanji and save her friends. Back at the oasis, a dancer approaches Dr. Bravestone and asks to meet him later. Ruby realizes that this must be Dr. Bravestone's former partner and the flame they were supposed to find. Following her to an upper floor they see the Falcon Jewel guarded by hyenas along with Jurgen and several of his men. The gathering apparently was to announce and mourn the loss of Jurgen's hyena master, Dagfin. Feeding his remains to his hyenas, Jurgen informs the gathered crowd that he had no option but to punish his mistake. The power goes out for a moment just then and a woman steals the key to the Falcon Jewel's chest but is caught by Dr. Bravestone before she can go any further. Jurgen then wants his key back, and that's when Ruby recognizes the woman as Spencer as she is simultaneously killed. Spencer playing Ming realizes that his grandfather is in the game with Milo, and Fridge was now Professor Oberon. He tells them that they should not have followed him into the game, and confesses that he wanted to feel mighty like Dr. Bravestone once again. But he was sadly stuck being a burglar with a pollen allergy. A woman then appears and comes looking for Dr. Bravestone. She informs him that Jurgen is going to meet the Kababic brothers at his fortress to trade the Falcon Jewel and form an alliance in return urging him and the others to retrieve the jewel before such an alliance is formed, she mentions having to leave before Switchblade finds her, recognizing that her husband Switchblade is Dr. Bravestone's weakness, and hoping to find the desert fruit, Ruby and Professor Oberon follow her to the Jumanji berry tree. Meanwhile, Ming and Finbar break into a stable with Bravestone as lookout, while Ruby displays her acrobatic skills to easily arrive at the tree and grab the fruit. However, she soon falls into the water below because of the weight of the fruit, she seems to be fine despite being in contact with the strange water, but suddenly separated by an explosion the two there soon realize that their characters have been exchanged with Fridge being Ruby and Martha being Professor Oberon. Meanwhile Dr. Bravestone discovers his physical strength and gets into a fight with a bunch of people. As he continues to smash things around, Ming attempts to lure the camels out when she realizes that Finbar can speak to them because of his additional linguistic skill. While they carry out negotiations, Fridge rejoices at finally being in an athletic body, Wanting to experience Ruby's acrobatic skills for himself he mimics her path to the tree and ends up falling in the water. Yet again, Professor Oberon helps Ruby out of the water which causes them to switch their characters back. Meanwhile, Switchblade's arrival with his men compels Dr. Bravestone and the group to quickly escape the place on camels and they meet Ruby and Professor Oberon waiting for them with the desert fruit. When everyone scrambles to get away from Switchblade and his men, Dr. Bravestone decides to take them on but this delay costs everyone a life as they get bombed.
While on their way to Jurgen's fortress the next morning, Eddie and Milo continue their bickering. Despite the others repeatedly telling Finbar not to pick a fight with Dr. Bravestone, he refuses to listen to them and eventually loses another life. When the camels refuse to go further towards Jurgen's territory, the group then continues on foot and comes across a labyrinth of connected bridges. Fridge surprises himself when he figures out a path through to the other end using Oberon's skill of geometry. However, the bridges all begin to move once Bravestone gets on the nearest one. Recognizing that they had to time their jump just right, Ming takes the lead to get onto the same bridge and the others promptly follow her. The level of difficulty goes up though with the arrival of a herd of mandrels. As Professor Oberon guides the group through the bridges, Finbar continues to state mandrel facts at an agonizingly slow pace, quickly making their way across bridges, Ruby mistakenly gets onto the wrong one leaving the others to helplessly watch as she gets flung off by a mandrel. Ming also misses her chance to get onto the right bridge and fights off a mandrel even as Ruby crashes down into the game again. Dr. Bravestone saves Ming and then proceeds to shake the bridge to get rid of the mandrels. However, Ming also gets flung onto a lower bridge with Ruby there. Together, they get onto a broken bridge and Ruby gets them to safety on the other side. Bravestone joins Professor Oberon and Finbar, to which Oberon sprains his ankle and Finbar hangs on for dear life. Bravestone cuts the ropes of the bridge and then finally gets Finbar and himself onto the other side, but they get surrounded by a bunch of mandrels. Alex's character Jefferson arrives on a horse just in time and scares the mandrels away. He then informs the group that Bethany brought him there and that the horse named Cyclone is actually her. Later, Milo and Eddie finally talk to each other without bickering and fighting. When Eddie asks Milo why he suddenly decided to look for him, he confesses that he has a terminal illness implying that he did not have a lot of time left, that he felt like making amends with his friend before it's too late. Before moving to the last level, Professor Oberon complains that not being the right character was a major hindrance for them as a group. He then accidentally discovers a river with the same charged water that surrounded the Jumanji berry tree. Using it to their advantage, everyone except Ruby and Jefferson jumps into the river to get back to their actual characters while Eddie becomes Ming and Milo becomes Cyclone the horse. Later, while the group warms up in a cave, Ming and Cyclone are nabbed by Jurgen's soldiers. To get them back, the team splits up to sneak into the fortress and Professor Oberon and Finbar get mistaken for being the Kababik brothers. On the other side of the fortress, Ruby and Dr. Bravestone climb an ice wall to get to its dungeon. On their way, she asks him why he cancelled their plans to meet during the year, and he replies that his life was headed nowhere. She kindly points out that one needs to have people around them even more at such times instead of keeping them all at a distance as he did. Meanwhile Jefferson reaches the barn where Cyclone is held but steps on a trap and loses a life. Getting back again he looks around the place carefully and thinks of a plan. The other duo reaches the dungeon and take out a guard only to see Ming in a cell. She tells them that she passed a vault while being brought up to the dungeon and that the only way to get there was a grate in the ceiling. In the barn Jefferson loses another life leading to him being down to his last one now. Meanwhile Jurgen's soldiers escort Professor Oberon and Finbar to meet their boss. Elsewhere, Ming directs Ruby and Dr. Bravestone to the vault and they try to get her to use her skills to retrieve the Falcon Jewel. At the barn, Jefferson finally reaches Cyclone and discovers something about his skills. Unfortunately, Ming finds the chest empty since Jurgen is wearing the Falcon Jewel around his neck when he greets the Kababik brothers. Realizing that they had come without their sister who was to be his bride, he threatens to cut their heads off. It is only when Ruby introduces herself as their sister and requests Jurgen to release her brothers that he frees Professor Oberon and Finbar. However, just as she is about to grab the Falcon Jewel, a message arrives from the real Kababik brothers regarding a delay in their journey, and the imposters are caught. Dr. Bravestone gets rid of Professor Oberon's captors and Ruby gets flung away. As it turns out, Dr. Bravestone is no match for Jurgen either, as he is also quite easily flung some distance away. Noticing a leak in his pocket, Dr. Bravestone grabs the desert fruit seeing which Jurgen falters and orders his men to finish everyone while he makes his way out. Finbar urges Dr. Bravestone to stop Jurgen and retrieve the jewel while he decides to check his backpack for help. When he plays some music, Ruby and her dance fighting skills easily work through the rest of Jurgen's soldiers even as Dr. Bravestone anchors his airship to prevent him from leaving. With the help of Ming, Finbar and Professor Oberon, Ruby displays her new strength of wielding nunchucks to skillfully take down the last of Jurgen's men, and they rush outside just in time to see Dr. Bravestone entering the airship. Having recognized that the Jumanji berry was Jurgen's weakness, Dr. Bravestone smashes it on him and jumps off the airship with him, grabbing the Falcon Jewel. He then pushes Jurgen off while holding onto one of the ropes from the airship. Meanwhile, Cyclone insists that Ming gets on his back and then runs in Spencer's direction. Quite surprisingly, it is then revealed that Cyclone is a Pegasus and effortlessly flies to Spencer. After Ming catches the Falcon Jewel, Cyclone keeps flying higher and once it catches the sunlight, everyone calls out Jumanji's name and just like before a massive beam ends the game. Nigel arrives as the group celebrates and thanks everyone for their efforts, promising to return the Falcon Jewel to its rightful owner. He takes it from Dr. Bravestone as everyone gets ready to leave Jumanji, suddenly. Milo's Cyclone lets Finbar know that he wishes to stay back, 
After an emotional goodbye from his best friend Eddie, Cyclone takes off into the distance beginning a new life within Jumanji. The others wish him nothing but the best and exit Jumanji to return to Spencer's basement in Brantford. Having cleared their misunderstanding in Jumanji, Martha gives Spencer a hug. That evening, Spencer and his grandfather join Martha, Bethany, and Fridge at the diner. As Eddie gets emotional being back in his restaurant and speaks to Nora, the diner's new owner, Spencer joins his friends. When Nora tells Eddie that she doesn't have a manager anymore, he offers to stay around and help. Meanwhile, Spencer reconciles with everyone and urges them to visit him in New York soon. He also mentions that they should all agree never to return to Jumanji again. However, he seems to have spoken too soon as just then, a repairman arrives to check the heater at Spencer's home and is intrigued when he sees the broken console of Jumanji. The game is inadvertently triggered leading to the herd of ostriches from Jumanji appearing outside the diner. The end, and as usual if you enjoyed this movie franchise recap and like to see more, make sure to smash that like and subscribe button, thank you.